This portion of the class is going to talk about how to use embedded assessments to improve instruction. Now, embedded assessments refer to assessments that are integrated within instruction to serve to monitor engagement, mastery, and growth of academic skills. Now, this is traditionally thought of as formative assessment, but as we have discussed, all assessment is formative when it's used to improve instruction. And so it doesn't really matter if it's during instruction, before instruction, or after instruction to be formative. So we're going to talk about this type of assessment as embedded assessment, meaning it's part of the instructional process. The main question we are seeking to answer is the extent to which my students are growing from the conditions that I am providing in my classroom. I don't want them to be bored. I want them to be engaged and excited. The broader question of whether or not my students are learning can be broken down into some additional considerations. First, have I captured their attention by establishing a meaningful context, something that matters to them? Two, have I made the new knowledge or skill accessible? Three, are students learning or meeting my objectives? Four, for advanced learners, have I sufficiently challenged and engaged them? And five, for less ready students, do I have enough supports to keep them engaged and moving towards mastery? Now, these two can come down to have I differentiated effectively, and that's how we'll treat it going forward, but they are separate. Six, are my physical, cognitive, social, emotional supports adequate? In other words, am I meeting all those IEP and 504s that I have, have talked about uh, in the pre-assessment portion? And then finally, were my pedagogical strategies effective? Were my groupings, my pacing, my uh, instructional technology was all that effective in engaging my students and helping them learn. So going forward now, we are going to look at each one of these questions individually in a little more detail. First, did I provide a meaningful context? Well, this question can be broken down into a few more. Did I appeal to their interests? Did I find something that latched on and sparked their imagination? Did I find something that they value? Even if they don't find something cognitively interesting, they might find it as something that can help them. Did I make that link? Have I made the context an authentic one? In other words, am I doing something that they can see applies to their real life now as a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grader, first grader, or whatever, right? Or in the near future. Have I provided a strong rationale for how the central focus of the lesson, the big idea, can help them in their lives, right? And sometimes, again, this works hand in hand with the authentic context in that maybe in some cases I have a real world context, but I got to sell it. And I give them some reasons why it really matters. Now, ultimately, I'm asking the question of do my students care about what we're learning? And if not, what can I change to make them care? Not make them care, maybe, but get them a little closer to caring. Now, examples of meaningful context are as follows. Uh, suppose that you had the math goal uh, that students will be able to solve division problems with fractions. Now, if I'm thinking back about student assets, right, I have student interests, cultural assets, and community assets as well. From a personal standpoint, I know that Kids usually think about food and money, uh, especially if they're at the age where they're working with fractions. Many students will have had the challenge of sharing resources and food with siblings and friends and adding this little dividing by a fraction. You know, what if you cut the number of hours in half? What does that mean? Um, how might that impact how you share or allocate your time and resources? For cultural, I can think about common family organizational structures where division of space, food, technology, and responsibilities are sometimes unequal. And for community, I can think about sharing the playground or student resources evenly among grades, homerooms, and smaller groups. All these things I can work into uh, my division problems. Um, If I think about how all these might be most effective, the context that I might choose are that students are elected as a classroom president, have been given a yearly budget that they must divide for food, materials, learning, and field trips. Options and constraints are provided and things change, and the budget must be balanced with all the funds used and distributed equally. The 
best budget wins will be used for the remainder of the school year. So actually saying that, all right, this is how much money we have allocated for different things from petty cash or my own personal funds or from any fundraisers we might do for the classroom. Um, let's make a budget for it. Let's plan out how we're going to use this. And then I'm going to introduce some changes about how the cost might change fractionally. And then they have to adjust their budgets accordingly. That could be a real world context that some students might really get into. Uh, for a social studies goal, right? Suppose that I want them to identify the different parts of a map, compass rows, key scale, legend, oceans, continent, equator, prime meridian, latitude, and longitude, right? If I'm thinking about my student assets on a personal level, maybe they dream of going places and I can have them identify where they want to go on a dream vacation. If I'm thinking of from a cultural perspective, everybody has a different family tree and a different place of origin if they start tracing things back. Um, having people identify where they originally came, well not originally came from, but where they recently came from a few generations ago and having people make maps of those places complete with keys and scales and everything um, where, where it's situated in the world and then assembling a big global map might be a really nice idea. Uh, from a community perspective, I can think about different neighborhoods and in order to get the latitude and longitude and all that other stuff in there that isn't oceans, for instance, uh, isn't in a neighborhood, I can have maybe them compare our neighborhood to different neighborhoods in different cities or different parts of the city or around the globe. Ultimately, from these, I might choose just this idea that students are going to do the ancestry model, make a map of their place of origin with a list of other things that they have to include in the key and then we will find uh, some kind of way to represent it globally where they will have to use latitude, longitude, and prime meridian and equator. Now suppose that I think about those things and that, that's really a planning exercise, right? And I, I think I made a meaningful context because I used my student assets, but the big question is how do I know if it actually worked, right? I used my pre-assessments uh, to get my initial plan going. To assess whether or not it's effective, I really have to start making some observations of what is their level of engagement? What is their body language? How are they talking? What are they talking about? Or asking them directly as a class or individually, right? And so that turns into feedback during the lesson via anonymous surveys through something like Google Forms or conversations. I can also do this after the lesson with these same methods. And if you haven't used Google Forms before, it is a very good tool. It's free. It's really easy to work with. And this is one that I use uh, for some of my classes, or one of my classes, I should say. Um, when we're talking about something like validity, something you've covered. How well do you feel you understand the validity concepts? A self-assessment idea. It's a good question to ask to get what their feelings are, but it's not a, usually a very accurate estimate of what their true ability is. I want to get at, do you find this class valuable? Um, and I could, instead of just saying the class, I could talk about specific exercises we did. I could ask them about whether it was enjoyable, right? Made me feel like the chairman of the board or chills, thrills, and spills, right? And then allow them to make any suggestions that they want. Now, I can add additional things. What should we do next time? How did this matter to you, if at all? Uh, how is this affecting your motivation? Do you find this you know, validity concept, or in our case, learning about maps or dividing with fractions more interesting? than you did before? Are you more motivated to do it than you were before? Are you having a hard time getting yourself started? I can talk about how their groups are working. If I put them into groups, I can talk about various activities and get specific feedback. And I can even get at personal takeaways. All in all, what are you taking away from this? And it's a fast and valuable way to get feedback. So answering all these questions can be done in a variety of methods, but you should be paying attention of whether or not the context was meaningful. Next question, did I make my lesson accessible? Have I made the new knowledge, strategy, or skill easy to get at? Does it make sense? Can we execute it? 
I try to make it accessible in my planning. Again, I'm always starting with the planning by following my learning progression. And now you've read an article on learning progressions and you understand that is the sequence of ideas of how knowledge is built. A lot of people do it by looking at the end product and working backwards, but you don't have to do it. There are a lot of different structures that you can follow, um, but it makes sense to think intentionally about it. So once I make my learning progression, I need to make sure that I follow it. Uh, second, I want to use those student assets not just to get them engaged and motivated, but to access existing networks of knowledge. Learning is a lot easier when you already know a bunch of stuff. If you've ever learned a, a new language, right? Learning a new word, when you know the language already, like if I learn a new word in English, it's really easy for me to remember what it is and what it means. Because all I really have to do is say at once, oh, that's a tortoise, right? Or when I got a cat, it was a torby. I've never heard of torby before, uh, which is uh, a mix between a tabby and a tortoise uh, cat. And so when we learned the name that she, or the, the breed, I guess, that she was a torby, uh, it just stuck. And I could say it. I knew what it meant immediately. However, if I was just learning Spanish and you tried to give me that new term, it would be a lot harder for me to take that and be able to use it in common everyday conversation, especially when I have to juggle the plurals and the tenses and the, um, whether it's masculine or feminine and all that other stuff. Right. I also try to make it accessible by establishing what success looks like, by giving them that target that they're shooting for. I need to do it for myself, but it's really good to do it for them too. Then I need to make sure that I model every thought, skill, process, strategy in a clear and manageable way so they can see right how it's done. Then I also need to allow them the opportunity to process and practice. If I model everything, I can go step by step and I can even put it on YouTube so they can watch it over and over, but there's nothing like actually doing it. If you've ever done a do-it-yourself project that you saw on the internet, I'm sure you've had the experience that it's not as easy as somebody makes it look. I've tried this with car repair many times, and I ultimately have always succeeded, but it usually takes me about 10 times as long, and there's a lot of cold sweat involved, thinking that I won't be able to get the car back together, right? So maybe I'll just start taking it to a mechanic. Now, the question is then, how do I know if I've been successful? So I can do all this stuff to plan while I'm teaching. I can show them what they're, they're shooting for. I can model all the processes and I can give them opportunities to process and practice. And I know if I'm successful by when I look at what they're doing. Are they engaged? Are they being frustrated? And I can reframe frustration as a good thing, just like when you're exercising, right? Feeling the burn means your muscles are breaking down and they're going to build stronger. And if you're running, breathing hard means that you're building more endurance and everything like that. Learning is the same way. When you're frustrated and confused, that means you are ready to accept some new knowledge and have it stick. So reframing that, that frustration and confusion is a part of, often a part of learning, is a great way to go. Right, but I want to be not. I want to acknowledge that and be aware of it. Um, I also want to compare what they actually do with my predictions of what they're going to do. Sometimes I overestimate my students. Sometimes I underestimate my students. And sometimes it's different. Some students I'm overestimating, and some I'm underestimating. So the question is, in this case of accessibility, are they doing as good as I thought and not less well? Right, and a lot of times. When uh, you look at teacher, reflect, teacher reflections on uh, different lessons that they've done, they usually when there's a problem, it's because they forgot to do something or they assumed their students could do something that they couldn't. All those language demands we talked about in the pre-assessment phase, right? In that case then, right, if I missed a step, I can go back and provide some remediation and it's there for next time, and I can give it to this class too. The final way I know if I've been successful is by answering the next question. Are my students making progress toward the goals? Now, if I'm trying to figure out whether or not they're meeting the objective, right, I'm probably going to be looking at when they're practicing independently or in small groups. How many students 
are getting it immediately? How many students are struggling and trying or having to exert a lot of effort but still being successful? How many students are struggling and not really getting it? And how many students have no idea of what's going on? Right. In order to see this, I have to give them something to do. And I have a couple options, right? I can have a whole class activity. You know, after I model and everything, and now I'm going to do independent practice, I can just put some problems up on the board and have a couple students come up and, and solve them. Right. They can talk about what they're doing. It can be led by me. It can be led by the students. Right. And we can use this to model strategies to address common problems and so on. But I'm only going to get information on those students that come up and only while they're up at the board, right? So the great things are it's easy, it's fast. Students get to talk about, especially if I say, talk about how you're solving this problem. How, talk about how you're addressing the situation. You get to hear what other people think. Students can ask questions and so on. And it's, it's, it's got a lot of stuff going for it. Problems, of course, are free riders or people who just kind of don't do anything but get the credit. So if three people come up and successfully solve, and I think that the whole class can solve, well, a lot of people didn't do anything. I will also have some control freaks and strong personalities oftentimes that if I let it be student-led, they will want to take over. I also have the danger of confirmation bias where I will want, pe I will want to believe that people understand what's going on, even though it may be the case that they don't, right? And I can remember when the first year I was teaching, uh, I was teaching an advanced statistics class, and there was one student who, um, you know, he talked a good game, and he always looked like he knew exactly what was going on, and I would cue on him. He sat right in the middle of the room, and I'd be saying something, and he'd be nodding his head, like with this intense look on his face, like, yeah, you know, keep talking, man. I'm buying everything you're selling. Uh, and when it came time for the first test, I realized that he was one of the worst students in the class, right? His homework was always done, but my homework was really well structured. Uh, I gave them the answers most of the time so they could do some self-assessing. And I totally missed the boat. So uh, you have to be careful of your confirmation biases. You will assume because it's in your best interest that your students get it. You will look for any evidence that they get it unless you're very careful uh, and control that bias. Now, another option I have are small group activities, right? The great thing is that there's more personal responsibility, more direct practice, more people get a chance to try things. Students are still articulating their thoughts and hearing others' opinions. But I still have the problems of free riders, control freaks, and confirmation bias, just to a lesser extent. I can do this in a cooperative or a competitive manner. I can assign roles. I can vary the amount of student control that I actually give, right? All these things I can do to make it really good. Finally, I have individual activities. Everybody does their own thing, right? I get information on everyone, which I don't get with the other two. Uh, it takes more time, though. It's uh, time heavy in terms of if I have to grade and rate everybody's work, right? If I put people in groups of four, right? And then I have people do individual things while well, I've just increased my grading time by four. Um, if I'm thinking of, the, if I think that articulating your ideas to your peers and using your peers as a resource is a really good thing, I don't get that here. And as a teacher, right, you want to maximize the learning resources in the room. And the students are a great resource. If everything is always individualized, you don't really get to utilize that resource. So when you can, let people work together. Ultimately, you do need individual um assessment, but you get much more mileage if you have a greater proportion be uh, peer or group led. Now, with individual activities, because they are so time intensive, it's best if some portion of the grading is automated and you can isolate some specific tasks for manageability. Now, in mathematics, this is really easy, right? You can have quizzes be auto-graded online and so on. Um, and there are ways that you can design it to be diagnostic, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but in other areas like social studies and language arts, um, say that I am having students make a map, like we talked about in the Meaningful Context, if I want to automate some of that process, you know, ultimately everybody's got to make their own map, right? 
I can automate once they locate their country of origin or their region that they're going to look at. Instead, I want them to make a map that includes the climate and the resources and so on. I can create a, a quiz or a list where they enter it into an actual uh, Google form or some kind of quiz uh, application that will autocorrect it and summarize it and send it to me so I don't have to do all of that stuff. Language arts is the same thing to get them ready if they're writing a persuasive essay to make sure they have basic skills uh, for punctuation and, and structure in place. I can give them some tasks in which they have to evaluate other people's essays and look at it for uh, whether or not the conclusion follows from the premises or whether or not the grammar and punctuation is correct. Right. So there are opportunities for me to identify what can I automate. And if I can automate it, I should automate it because it saves me a ton of time in the long run. With all these three options, the best thing to do in almost all cases is to use a mix as appropriate. Now, some examples of this, right? If we use our goal of students will be able to solve division problems with fractions. All right, my whole class, I model and I go through and introduce the topic a couple times, maybe, well, maybe two. And then I put some additional problems on the board and ask some students to come up and solve using Think Aloud protocols and so on. Uh, maybe I put uh, some problems up there that lead to common misconceptions and so on. And I can ask questions and, and uh, make the experience as beneficial as possible. The good thing about this, right, is that students are doing the work. They get to see other students doing the work and working through difficulties and hear what their thought process is. But again, it doesn't give me a lot of information about everybody in the room. If I had a small group activity instead, right, I could give problems to different groups that they could, la could collaboratively work on, and I could walk around and monitor and address any issues. Problems might include simplified and challenging versions of the skill to accommodate different needs, right? And the great thing is that I do get more detail and student collaboration. The con, of course, is that I still don't get to see where everyone's at. I will have those problems of free riders and such. If, on the other hand, then I, I switch to individual work, right? I can monitor progress, but while I'm spending time with one student and, and answering a question, there are maybe 20, 30 students that aren't getting my attention and can't get my attention. Again, I'm not really utilizing my resources, and I'm giving fewer opportunities for students to express their thoughts. All right, so the recommendation is a combination of whole class instruction to model and to give some students a chance to do the modeling for you, moving to small group work with differentiated tasks to make sure that everybody is engaged, and then ultimately to individual work at the end to see what people can do, maybe taking five or six minutes for this after they've had plenty of practice. Right Now, in terms of automating things, a lot of times people think that, well, if I automate something, I will just know if the question is right or wrong, and I can never really see what type of problem uh, they're having. So I won't know what I should do. I'll just know that it's wrong. Now, you can make multiple choice type questions diagnostic. For example, say that you're dividing fractions and there are common mistakes that you know of through your experience of teaching this, is that students typically forget to multiply at a diagonal and they often forget to simplify, right? So if I'm thinking about the common mistakes somebody might make, I make sure my answers reflect those common errors. So A is the answer that you get if you just add the fractions straight across, right? Uh, in, in, in not even a meaningful way, but I'm just, I'm thinking of multiplication, right? Where I say maybe multiply across or even cross multiply across, but I end up just adding it. I get two plus one equals three over three plus two equals five, right? Might not get a lot, but I might get some people who go with that. 2, 6 is the answer you get if you multiply straight across and forget to simplify, right? Uh, one third is the answer if you multiply but forget uh, and simplify. And four thirds is actually the correct answer if you do the, the 2 by 2 and the 3 by 1, right? So that works out to tell me what percentage of students are consistently making different types of errors. If I just do this with one problem, it won't tell me a lot because I don't know what guessing, uh, what impact guessing had on the results. If I have people do three or four problems, 
I can identify which students are consistently making, say, this same error of B, just multiplying straight across. Uh, and that allows me to target my remediation practices or feedback and future opportunities for that student. Another example might be language arts. Say that I want students to be able to write a persuasive essay with a premise, three supporting facts, and a logical conclusion. Likewise, for the whole, like with the math sample, with the whole class, I can do some modeling. I have the same pros and cons. With a small group, I could have them evaluate some essay examples and or brainstorm arguments and conclusions for a given premise. I can monitor and walk around, and I have the same pros and cons as I did with the math. With the individual, I could have students generate supporting facts from a list of premises and draw a logical conclusion. For, or I could do this for their own uh, topic, right? Work is turned in and evaluated and feedback is provided. Now, this, of course, is the most time-consuming one, but it is the, one, the only one that gives me information on every student. So I should think about how I could automate some of this stuff. Mm. Um, and I can think of, right, making sure that they know what a premise is, what a conclusion is, what logical means, uh, what following from us by having them evaluate different argumentations and identifying the ones that actually work and the ones that don't. Then I'll at least know who gets it and who doesn't, and it's all automated. I get information on every student, but I don't have to spend two hours grading it. I can just let the computer compile it and look at the results and know who I know who needs what type of support. Again, the recommendation is to use a combination uh, to model small group work, to use peer resources and individual work, ultimately as an assessment and as some form of ownership. Okay. So now, as I'm going through this and I see who's making progress towards the goal, I have to ask myself, did I differentiate effectively? And the first part of this is, have I challenged or engaged the advanced students? Now, this can be broken down into two important questions. Did those students who mastered the objective quickly or had mastered it before class began and didn't even learn anything, spend as much time learning new materials or advancing their skills as other students? In other words, if I'm teaching this dividing with fractions uh, lesson and I have 10 students who already know how to do this, they are not learning anything by taking part in this class, right? And so I need to ask myself, what is the next step? in this? How do I make this more difficult and not just give them more uh, problems or bigger numbers, right? How do I actually extend the skill? And what I can do here is I can look at the standards. I can look at the learning progression from grade to grade and within content areas, and I can figure out what is upcoming, right? I also want to ask myself, am I positively impacting the motivation of those advanced students? Because if I'm not challenging them, I'm probably not getting them to like the content more. They're going to think it's boring uh, because they're never learning anything. And despite popular belief, learning is fun, uh, right? So if I'm thinking of extension tasks, what I can do, right? I have a couple common options that people fall into. One, additional problems of the same task, not recommended. Um, they'll resent the extra work just because I'm smart. I get to do more work. Well, it takes you less time. Well, right, but I'm not learning anything. So even though this is the one that is most commonly followed, I would not recommend doing it. Uh, second, increase difficulty through complexity or speed of response. Now, this can be recommended, but requires an additional rationale uh, to get interest going. All right. So in other words, I could give them a more complicated problem that has maybe an, an additional step. If I'm thinking of uh, how this could look in its more complicated forms of word problems, different situations, different authentic tasks, right? I can incorporate that. If I want them, because I think that speed is an important thing, say in solving some mathematical problems or in some types of reading tasks, I could make it a timed topic that kind of gamifies it and adds some excitement for some people. Um, I just make I just need to make sure that they buy into why this makes sense for them. And I need to make sure that there is a reason why it makes sense. Now, the third one, and this is the best one, 
in my opinion, is the integ increased integration of concepts. So recommended, but only if it makes sense in a larger progression. So again, you have to think about where is the school going? What future skills is it supporting in terms of maybe algebra, calculus, or geometry, right? Depending on what I'm teaching. I will need additional rationales to get that interest going again, and I should have those. So let's take some examples of extension tasks. Mathematics. Students will be able to solve division problems with fractions, right? So my extension task could be to incorporate improper fractions, mixed numerals, or integrate with decimals, right? Thinking about how does this basic skill get extended? What does true mastery look like? Second objective. Science. Students will relate mass, volume, and density with one another, right? My extension tasks I could incorporate specific gravity, the difference between mass and weight, or the impact of temperature on mass, volume, and density for gases, liquids, and solids. For social studies, I suppose I have a goal of identifying the parts of the map. Uh, my extension task could incorporate seconds into latitude and longitude, identify additional scales or key, or fold in different types of maps that incorporated different types of data like how much income and where is it concentrated in a city or a region? Uh, what about life expectancy? How does that change across different regions? Temperature, population, whatever I want, right? And I can get them to start thinking about maps as a way to graphically represent things, and this enhances their data literacy. Finally, we can have a language arts example of writing a persuasive essay. And if I have the basic, right, uh, of a premise, three supporting facts, and a logical conclusion, right, I can incorporate counterfactuals, contradictions, or the anticipation of counterarguments. I can go with logical fallacies, argumentative qualities, sources, perspectives, or other similar argumentative skills that will enhance the students who already have mastered this basic skill, right? And again, the idea is typically to increase the complexity or, when you can, integrate new concepts and truly extend the skill to prepare them for the future or the real world. Now, the other side of this is were students with lower levels of readiness able to engage with the material? Were the cognitive scaffolds that I put in place effective? And if not, how can I improve them? Were there any relevant scaffolds that I missed? Did they learn or make progress toward the objective, right? Even if students did not meet the objective, did they at least make progress towards it? Sometimes I will have students who are, you know, not ready for whatever it is I'm teaching. So I'm teaching a seventh grade literature class and I have a student who is reading at a first grade level, right? Uh, the reading tasks and the reading comprehension might be too much to expect, but I can still teach them some of the content as long as I provide the appropriate scaffolds for the skill. Because if I'm focusing on different themes, right, having them read uh, with a partner or have some kind of audio supplement where they can hear and understand the words rather than having to spend all the time decoding them, right, that will get me towards my themes, even though I'm only getting partial um, mastery of the reading portion of it. Finally, did they display increased mastery of basic skills? So if I am working on some of the more fundamental things, are they more accurate? Do they do it faster? Do they understand why a little bit more? And now to do this, right, um, you will cover this in other classes, but common supports include visualizations, graphic organizers, simplified problems or structures, simplified language cues and reminders, or personalized metaphors. Visualizations can be things like graphics that most people like, and even though some people say that, well, I'm a visual learner, well, we are all visual learners. And graphs, when I can present information in a new way, right, uh, it helps everybody. I can use graphic organizers to help people think about how their ideas relate to each other. Simplify problems or structures where I get rid of all the distraction. I keep the language and the numbers simple or the task very straightforward and structured. I can use simpler language, right? Rather than saying the automobile hurtled furiously down the asphalt thoroughfare towards urban luminescence in the distance, I can just have them read the car drove quickly down the road towards the city lights. 
same idea. Uh, one is much harder to understand than the other. And there are some websites that actually um, will provide uh, different versions of the same text. The content is the same, but the sentence complexity and the vocabulary varies among three or five grade levels. And those are downloadable. So those are some of the resources that are out there. I can have cues and reminders of the structured steps, or I could have personalized metaphors, which have the students really relate whatever we're talking about to them. Those are very time intensive, uh, so you would want to use the other structures when you can because they're easier to implement and can have a more wide-reaching effect. Now, for this case, right, if I'm doing math and say that I want students to be able to solve division problems with fractions, I can have them use calculators in a restricted sense to at least get the concept and see how the numbers are working together. I can give them multiplication tables for basic facts. I can give them visual cues and reminders of the different steps they need to follow. Or I can use simplified language um, where I use terms like reciprocal product and quotient and I reframe them in a much uh, simpler way <laughs> that students uh, understand. Um, instead of product, I just say the answer, so to speak. Um, for science, suppose that I have my goal of students relating mass, volume, and density with one another. I can give them basic equation cues. I can give them hands-on activities to feel and see the changes, how when volume changes, when something uh, I'm not adding or taking anything away, that the density also changes. Um, I can also have some kind of visual organizer about the relationships between those two things uh, with visuals and real world examples. In social studies, right, if I'm trying to have them identify the different parts of the map, right, I can give them very simple maps that are visually uncluttered and visually simple. I can give them familiar maps that they have seen before to tap into their history and their existing knowledge. Or I can give them a simplified definition of terms like latitude and longitude, equator, or prime meridian. Uh, for language arts, suppose that again I have my persuasive essay goal. I can make the structures or the prompts incredibly structured. I can post grammar rules. I can personalize subjects. I can give them a thesaurus to use and I can have them spell check if I'm working on grammar and punctuation as well. So in this way I can support my students need and I can challenge my other students by extending the different tasks. Now, the next question then, are, are my supports comprehensive and effective? And by this, I'm not necessarily talking about the scaffolding, but I'm talking about those students with IEPs and 504 plans. And here's where I would like you to review the 504 plan document about sample accommodations and modifications. It's a multi-page document that goes over a variety of different 504 plans. Right now, with IEP students, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because you will be working with other professionals to make sure that that is all taken care of. But for 504 plans, a lot of times, at least in my experience, the teachers are given more freedom. There is a checklist and there's an agreed on plan. But if you just go with that, you often miss opportunities and other issues that might come up in different content areas or different instructional settings. So it's a good thing to think about what is the range that these things can take and what are my options, right? So 504 plans, when we think about the supports, right? We have environmental strategies, such as students who require a separate learning space or they need to take a break because the classroom gets too noisy uh, and say that some students are very distractible by noise or they get sensor sensorily overloaded uh, in some cases of people on the autism spectrum. I have organizational strategies as supports where I could have some maybe more direct instruction for students, much more structure in terms of time and reward. I can color code different cues. I can basically set up the environment to assist them in completing their tasks, whether it's just keeping their desk neat, being able to find their tools that they need, or moving from class to class. 
I also have behavioral strategies, and these are the most common 504 plans, at least in my experience, that utilize reinforcements. Different students get on different token economy plans uh, using logical consequences, parental conferences, or behavior contracts where the student starts to get some ownership uh, and do some problem solving about their own behavior. It's a good way to build strategies, so I highly recommend those. I have presentation strategies where I can use different alternate materials. We talked about instead of having a student read, I can have a student listen to a book. I could, for visually impaired students, use large print books. Uh, I could look at simplified language, or I could provide greater structure in lessons or prompts. And then ultimately, my evaluation methods, too, might have some accommodations. Uh, for oral testing, if a student has a hard time reading, but I'm not really trying to test them on their ability to read, right? They can tell me the answers. I can make some or get some translated materials, or I can vary my presentation style if it has something to do with my assessment. So making sure that these are all in place is really good. There's a, a part of an exercise that you'll be doing that will want you to utilize that 504 plan document um, to come up with uh, appropriate supports for different students and how you might uh, meet their needs depending on the lesson. The next question, was my lesson effective, right? And this is all about pedagogical effectiveness. And this is the final thing we'll be talking about. This addresses the extent to which my strategies, pacing, presentation, style, and activities resulted in high-level engagement. Things that I might reflect upon. Logistical gaps and delays. Were there periods of time where I was organizing, fuddling with technology, getting something to work, reorganizing something that caused unneeded delays, hiccups, or problems, right? Slow down the learning. Because when I'm waiting for the computer to, to get started and the projector to warm up, right? If I don't have it planned out so I have something else to do during that time, right? That's instructional dead time. Nothing's happening there. Everyone's just waiting. And because, you know, idle hands at the devil's workshop, it might also lead to some behavioral issues. I also have my overall levels of engagement that I would be thinking about in terms of my pedagogy. Were people into it? You know, did the format that I presented, the pace that I went at, the examples I gave, were they all effective? Were all my tricks and strategies worth it? Or do I need to modify that? When I think of my pacing, right, uh, how fast I went, did I give some students too much time? Did I give all students too much time or not enough time? Again, usually when you're teaching something the first time too, you don't give enough time. It's very, very easy to underestimate how long some things will take because there are so many things that you don't think of. And I would highly recommend when you are thinking about pacing to always have contingency plans about if things are taking too long, what am I going to do? Or if things are going too fast, what am I going to do? Um, what about my variety of activities? Did I keep them moving and, and keep things interesting or was it just the same old, same old all day long? Now, if the same old, same old is something that the students love and always gets them excited uh, and engaged, well, great, go with it. But a lot of times, different types of activities, small group, technology, independent research, um, even some uh, mindfulness exercises, right, all have their place. And it's best if you use different kinds, depending on what the situation calls for. Finally, did I nurture their motivational resources? Did I use non-controlling language so people felt like they were in charge of their own learning? Did I give them compelling rationales or reasons why we're doing what we're doing and, and did they buy in? Did I give them ownership and autonomy? Did I acknowledge and accept frustration if or when it happened, right? And these are all things that I should think about as I am working through my lesson and reflecting upon it. There's a resource that I will be posting on this nurturing motivational resources. Uh, it is an optional read, but it is something that you can look into. A lot of people, uh, practicing teachers who have read it, found it very, very helpful. So in summary, lessons should, when at all possible, occur in a meaningful context. New knowledge and skills and abilities should be accessible 
and I should think about how my students are progressing using a variety of whole class, small group, and individual work. I should make sure that I differentiate using extensions and scaffolds and that all 504 plans and IEPs are in place. And I should think at the end of the day, as a practice, I should focus on several key dimensions to evaluate how effective my teaching was. Finally, based on what we have learned, I'd like you to complete the classroom instructional evaluations according to the directions provided in the document. I will also include the answers so you can check your thoughts against how I thought about things and further your understanding. Now, in some cases, you may not agree with what I think, but it's important for you to see the rationale that I had, even though yours might be different. And that is all.